Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. Once again, it is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. Uh, you will all have to constrain my exuberance about doing this live stream. I am so excited. I am joined by uh, Dominici Luca Grigo, who is the author of a gem of a small randomized clinical trial entitled Effect of Helmet Non-Invasive Ventilation versus high-flown nasal oxygen on days free of respiratory support in patients with COVID-19 and moderate to severe hypoxemic respiratory failure. And the two co-authors of the accompanying editorial, Lavina Munchi from Toronto and Jesse Hall from Chicago, respiratory support during COVID-19 pandemic. Domenico, you're my second Italian guest. I want to remind uh, the listeners, my first was Mauricio Sacconi, who I interviewed almost one year ago on March 13th, when he sadly announced, sadly and profoundly announced to the world that we had no idea what was coming. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you here. This is a small clinical trial, uh, just over 125 patients. Um, randomized to a helmet, and we'll be able to show you a picture of what that looked like versus high flow um, oxygen uh, to prevent a primary outcome and then a number of secondary outcomes. Um, the study was conducted between October and December, and the reason that's important because uh, it, uh, they all receive standard of care, what has become standard of care, corticosteroids. So, uh, Domenico, can you explain the study and what prompted you to do it? Good morning and many thanks for the invitation to join you. It's a great privilege to be here today and to present. So um, um, what we essentially did is that we um, enrolled patients in the intensive care unit who experiencing hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID-19 within, let's say, 48 hours from hospital admission, so in the very early phase of hypoxemic respiratory failure. And we randomized patients to receive either what we, let's say, consider the standard of care, uh, recently highlighted by clinical guidelines, which is the high flow oxygen delivered by nasal cannula, which is really easy to use at the bedside for every physician, and it delivers 60 liters of um, uh, air oxygen mixer to the patient at uh, uh, continuously uh, of heated and humidified gas. This, this was the control group and the intervention group received the continuous treatment, so early continuous treatment with a, a helmet and IV with a relatively high pressure uh, and positive end expiratory pressure and relatively low pressure support. So PEEP, which is the positive end expiratory pressure of 12, 10, 12 centimeters of water, and pressure support of 10, 12 centimeters of water that are somehow weird settings, but are those that we showed to be effective in relieving the inspiratory effort and in improving hypoxemia in uh, hypoxemic patients in a previous physiologic study published last year. And uh, mm, the primary endpoint was the uh, proportion of days um, that in which patients did not receive any form of, let's say, advanced respiratory support. So the kind of support that is uh, for which is an ICU is needed. So high flow, NIV, or invasive mechanical ventilation on a 28-day basis. So there was no difference in the primary outcome, but we found that uh, uh, there was a significant reduction in the amount of patients who required endotracheal intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation. So it was 50% versus 30%. So a significant reduction, which yields um, number needed to treat of five, which is quite low considering the amount of patients that we are treating. And uh, this finding was somehow consistent with the physiologic data we have on the benefit of IP in spontaneously breathing patients. And is seems somehow promising for a um, technique which is not very common in places uh, outside Italy. Lavina, when, when I sent you the paper to review and you read it, 
Um, did you light up or did uh, sometimes, you know, people have like pre-test. Do you like studies? Do you not like studies? What, what was your reaction when you first read it? So I was, um, I, so, so first of all, thank you for, for having me and congratulations, Domenico, on the study. I, I was very excited and enthusiastic to read it as soon as I saw the title. Um, there's There's been a lot of enthusiasm um, on this side of the ocean, I think, for the potential role of helmet non-invasive ventilation, and particularly in comparison to high flow nasal cannula, because to my knowledge, I think this is the first head-to-head -head comparison in an RCT. So I was I was very excited um, just because I'm intrigued by the potential role after uh, Dr. Patel's study and um, uh, Dr. Hall's study that was published a few years ago. And then because of the fact that it's COVID-19, there seems to be this, um, I guess, need to better understand the potential of all the different non-invasive strategies. So this was definitely timely. And I think it's important to understand the role, not just from a patient standpoint, with regard to reducing the risk of intubation, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when we heard of high mortality rates, but also from a health system standpoint, given the concern about capacities in our ICU. So I was definitely really excited uh, about the study when I had the uh, invitation to review it for sure. Now, Jesse, you're one of the world's experts in uh, the use of the helmet. You've written for JAMA and for our listeners, I just really want to thank all of the reviewers, but both Lavina and Jesse reviewed the paper in two or three days. I think we only received it two and a half or three weeks ago. J Jesse, when, when you got the paper, what did you think? I mean, you've been working at this for, I don't know, a decade or more. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. And Domenico, I add my congratulations to you and your colleagues. I'm one of the people outside Italy that have learned so much from the Italian uh, investigations involving this new interesting interface for patients. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my first reaction was uh, overlapped with some of the things Lavina said. Uh, I knew there had not been a, a really good head-to-head um, -head comparison of the helmet to uh, high-flow nasal cannula treatment. Uh, so that just that by itself, what whoever the patients were, sort of tweaked my interest. Uh, next, as I started to look at it and see how rigorously it was done, my hat was off yeah. to this group because on the one hand, it's so important to get studies done in this setting and the, the results are so important to us. On the other hand, it's about the toughest environment when your ICU is being overwhelmed or potentially so to do such studies. So the, the fact that the study was so well done uh, in under extreme conditions, uh, sort of just had my admiration, and you, you you're not going to see that very often. So that just you know hooked me, I guess, and then I kind of got into the the details of it. And like all studies, it sort of fits in a flow of uh, learning that you know you wish you had some other results, but you got some interesting, intriguing results, and now you have to kind of put it into the larger realm of uh, further study as well as current clinical practice. So I was I was hooked and thought this was an important trial. Dominica, just following up on what um, Jesse said, was it hard to do the study? Uh, it isn't, you know, you're, you're, you're overwhelmed, you're taking care of patients, many of whom are dying, the ICUs are really busy, and you say to a, a clinician, well, do you mind if I bother you a little more and randomize patients? N not easy, and we, we've had many conversations on this show about about trying to generate high quality evidence, was it hard to just do the study in the ICUs? Um, it was a little bit, I have to be honest, and this is um, I want to share my thanks to the all the co-authors and collaborators who are a lot, and this is why there are a lot because it was not easy. I can we can remember um, patients randomized randomized at mid midnight or two a.m. in the morning. So phone calls and um, uh, patients randomized in the web system. So it was not easy to do. But I think that thanks to the collaborative group, when you put all the efforts together, we we managed to do that in the during the second wave because the study was launched uh, as a, essentially at the same time the second wave started in right. Italy. So we had a, a, a strong wave, and uh, honestly. We were used to um, using the helmet in the first wave and since the since years, 
but uh, it was not easy to randomize patients to receive uh, one treatment or the other because sometimes you need to balance this with the um, attitude of the physicians and sometimes they felt like that the treatment was not proper uh, so it's I think this is an issue with all randomized controlled studies in which you randomize patients but we need this for generating evidence and to extending the knowledge we have on the on, on patients. What really surprised uh, us, for instance, is that uh, um, there was a huge difference in the rate of endotracheal intubation where there is no change in mortality. Right. Let's say in the, absolutely the same number. So it's 24%. So um, this reassured, for instance, uh, a lot of us saying, okay, um, the eye flow is safe. It's not really necessary. Okay, maybe the helmet allows you to avoid intubation in a certain amount of cases, but if you don't do not have the expertise, you don't have the tools to to use this uh, technique in the ICU because we need monitoring, we need to look after the patient with maybe a, a good nurse to patient ratio. The eye flow, the eye flow is a really good alternative. So um, this really reassured us also for the treatment of all the patients that came afterwards. Lavina, you you and Jesse both write quite a bit about, you know, primary outcomes uh, shows no difference. Secondary outcomes, you know, people talk about alpha spend and then whether or not you consider it exploratory or, or, or not. Let's put kind of the methods and statistical language aside because the both of you then write about how you're now thinking about this, um, whether you have experience or not and what it means. How have you thought about it? How have you, uh, uh, since the paper was published, or it's it's published as we speak, but since you read it, mm -hmm. so um, so yeah, there, I I feel like um, certainly intriguing, and I'm very excited to better understand its potential role as as one of our devices now in the treatment of acute respiratory failure. So, um, as Domenico highlighted, no difference in primary outcome of respiratory um, uh, free days. And while that may be a uh, important outcome from a system standpoint, uh, particularly during a pandemic, I think future research really needs to focus on how the different oxygen devices may impact better uh, patient-centered outcomes, such as fully reevaluate intubation and then further explore this outcome of mortality and other patient-centered outcomes, such as cognitive function, functional outcomes uh, following ICU. And I think what's very interesting is that I think at the end of the day, uh, as we design these further studies to further evaluate the non-invasive uh, non oxygen strategies, we need to be smart about exploring and understanding the different respiratory failure phenotypes. Because what we may discover is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It may be that in a subset of patients, uh, they may do well with high flow nasal cannula, and another subtype of patient, they may do better with um, more recruitment and the helmet interface. So I think at this point, um, we we need to better understand its role and in the design of these trials, be sprung about thinking through the different phenotypes of respiratory failure and, uh, and then maybe understand which subtypes have the greater response to one modality or, or another. Jesse, as, as I've already mentioned, you've been at this a long time. Um, does this move the dial for you? around helmets? Uh, it uh, puts my hand on the dial <laughs> and maybe slightly inclined in one direction. Uh, the business about the primary endpoint, you know, not being met, it turns out to be in part a power issue right. because earlier data, you know, suggested a good power calculation and they'd be able to determine if, if this was helpful for the, a large population of patients that would therefore get less respiratory support and therefore perhaps go through the system and be uh, returned to health sooner. That That's good from a public health point of view. As it turns out, there was less support needed. This got back in my mind to your earlier comment that if the standard of care is such a rapidly moving target, maybe yeah. with steroids now, we actually know one of the effects is reducing the amount and severity of respiratory failure. So so that's great that we now have that plugged into this study, but then your your power calculation may need to get adjusted. For the issue of uh, reducing the amount of intubation, 
I have a strong bias that that's just a good thing. Now, I know there could be arguments about maybe it's not as good a thing as we think. I, and those are kind of, a you know, for critical care uh, pro-con debates down the road, I'm sure. But in my thinking, it has usually been good when we have spared people mechanical ventilation invasively. Uh, and And even if mortality didn't change, I would be very interested in what happened to long-term outcomes for patients because getting an endotracheal tube and surviving the ICU experience usually makes your or is associated with your course being protracted and difficult to fully recover. And it's somehow I really think that we it would merit study to see if all you did was reduce the rate of invasive ventilation that in and of itself, apart from mortality, could still be a very good thing. Dominica, a couple questions have come in. What was the neurologic status of the patients? All patients were fully awake. Um, they were really uh, more dyspneic than we were expecting. You know that um, that um, it is. We have learned that sometimes these patients experience silent hypoxemia, uh, but this dyspnea score was like on average, because it was consistent with the data we have for hypoxemic respiratory failure of other, other etiologies. But they absolutely were fully awake. We left to the choice of the clinicians the use of sedatives and analgesic drugs. We know This is somehow a weakness of the study, because uh, they were not standardized. We have data showing that uh, on NIV, the use of the combined use of them may be associated with failure, but we try to uh, leave the use on the the, the, the choice on about the use of sedative and analgesic drugs with treating physicians, and it was com more common in the NIV group, and I think this was unavoidable because some, I, I we have to admit that is less comfortable than high flow, um, and it is shown us in this comfort scale, which is improved, which is in worse in the uh, uh, NIV group, but patients were fully completely awake until the required intubation. Yeah. And nobody required the intubation due to a cha so a dramatic change in the mental status, which is a concern about the use of um, helmet and IV, possibly about CO2 rebreathing and things like that. I have to reassure about this. Oftentimes when people write editorials for us, they go, could you just ask the author this question? We're, I'm just curious, because uh, there's not usually an exchange between editorialists and, and authors of papers. But Jesse and Lavina, now you have a chance to, to ask for some more details, or did you really do that? Or if so, uh, I, I'll start with you, Jesse. Do you have a question for Dominica about the study? Um, thanks, <laughs> Howard. Uh, uh, there could be many, but w one large difference between the group was the ability to prone some 60% of the high flow patients and 0% of the helmet patients can you think think about that with me uh you know tell me if that's just a condition of the therapy in your hands and you folks are more experienced than anyone uh and if it's just how it goes as a support treatment is it an important difference uh, between the two groups that one can be proned and one cannot because as you know there's sort of a proning literature predating COVID and continuing right on through uh, the management of COVID uh, patients. Um, oh, similarly to the drugs, to the analgesic drugs, we left these open to the physicians, which is, I think, both a strength and a weakness of the study, because the strength is based on the fact that uh, Elmet and IV may reduce the rate of endotracheal intubation as compared to high flow combined with prone position, which is a strength of the of the intervention. And this is also a weakness because the two groups were not balanced regarding this intervention. Um, and we, we left it open and we clinicians happen to um, use more frequently this tool uh, during high flow. So I th think there are two main reasons. One is that patients more 
Hypoxemia is more relevant during the high flow because the PF ratio in the helmet group is higher than the one in the high flow group, which, which, which could be a, a first cause. So there was a less feeling for the need of rescue treatment because the way it was used, this was a kind of rescue treatment. And the second reason is that it's more, much, more, much easier to prone the patient with the high flow that, than with the helmet and IV. And uh, we know that uh, this is interesting because this is something which is really pragmatic. So we know that patients in the high flow group are more easily pronable than those in the, in the helmet. Lavina, your questions? Yeah, I actually have um, two. So, so the first one actually surrounds um, tidal volume. So um, as you know from the face mask non-invasive ventilation literature, one of the concerns is that when it's applied across higher severities of respiratory failure, it's associated with a high risk of failure and potentially high mortality. And one of the mechanisms um, that's described is that the face mask non-invasive ventilation may lead to high tidal volumes and injurious tidal volumes. In your helmet population, I know it's challenging to measure tidal volumes through the helmet interface. Uh, if you look at just the subset that got intubated, there was a higher mortality just in helmet, which is likely just due to that, the fact that they have a higher severity of illness. But what do you think about the theory of helmet potentially inducing injurious ventilation through high tidal volumes. Was that something that you guys discussed or were concerned about at all in your population? And then did the sedation that you applied was part of that sedation to potentially blunt that effect? Um, this is a very good question. Uh, we would be delighted to have some physiologic measures like the inspiratory effort or the uh, tidal volume during helmet and IV. Uh, we did not. <laughs> We could not, because in the setting of a randomized trial in such an emergency context, it was not easy. We have uh, data showing that indeed the entity of inspiratory effort during helmet NIV is associated to the risk of endotracheal intubation. I think that this could be, this is possible also in the context of COVID-19 respiratory failure. Uh, we need more data, but um, I think that this reinforces the message that what we have shown is that the intervention which is capable to reducing endotracheal intubation is not only the application of helmet and IV in a continuous fashion in the early phase of the disease, but uh, the strict monitoring we applied. So I think that the, the message for the ICU physicians worldwide should still be about caution and in the use of any any non-invasive tool just to monitor patients to identify the treatment a, a treatment failure and to um, deliver prompt intubation and protective ventilation in case treatment failure is identified um, we try to use standardized criteria which can can be applied which is similar to those applied in the florali study it's the one published in the new england some some years ago about high flow and the jama and the uh, helmet and iv a uh, face mask and iv i'm sorry and uh, i think this can be applied also in other icu to identify treatment failure and for sure these are not physiologic measures that like the one we are searching but still this is something that can be easy apply to the bedside. Lavina, did you have a second question? Yeah, so um, have the results of this trial changed your day-to-day -day practice in your decision making about the application of helmet versus high flow? Uh, this is really difficult to respond. I think that one, one single randomized control trial, randomized trial cannot change the clinical practice, but I think it's another break in the wall of knowledge, um, but we were fearing what you were saying. So in the first way we used, um, we largely used the uh, helmet and IV, and we were always concerned about the risk of delaying endotracheal intubation. So we wanted to respond whether the um, intervention that we were applying in the clinical practice could be useful for the patients. And so um, I don't think we uh, we are changing our clinical practice in our centers. I'm speaking about the centers that participate in the trial. 
I think that we are continuing in the clinical practice we were having in the last six months, but we have been reassured that this, um, in, this intervention could be beneficial for patients. That, uh, and we did not have data, clinical data about the comparison of these two techniques, so we are not sure that what we were doing was something for, good for the patient or not. And I think this data reassured about the uh, use of helmet in the context of um, a pandemic, for sure, but with early, um, early identification of treatment failure, this could be something uh, uh, good for the patient indeed. Jesse, um, I think it's fair to say uh, you've been around a little longer than uh, the other two uh, individuals who are on this call. Um, Thanks. But, uh, so I, I'm trying to figure out the <laughs> nicest way to say that, Jesse. Anyway, <laughs> that was kind. That was kind. Oh, good. Was thank kind. you. Um, uh, you know, there's always an issue of technology creep in medicine, particularly in the United States. The United States is superb at technology creep, probably better than any other country. We um, are very good at it. Um, you know, you, there's not a mortality difference. You, you raise the issue, you, you think in general it's better not to receive mechanical ventilation. Uh, I never have outside of the need for anesthesia, so I, I imagine most people would agree with you, we're never going to have a 500 uh, patient RCT of helmets. I just can't imagine that, or a thousand patients. This was such a unique opportunity, such a homogeneous uh, presentation of a, uh, at least of a single viral disease. I know it has different manifestations. So, assuming we don't have that 500 or a thousand patient RCT. And, you know, we have a few studies, including yours and, and, and this one. What's the next three, four, five years look like for this technology? Well, uh, I, we certainly suffer from technology creep. Sometimes, you know, we uh, just uh, create a tool and then look for some place to start hammering away with it. And I, I get that. Uh, this, in a way, to me, is a little bit of, it's a tool that also allows a deceleration of of a care that is invasive. Um, and so that I keep a more careful eye on. It's a, it, there's a learning curve with the technology. You have to be good at it to be safe with it. Um, but in, in some funny ways, it's backing off the advance of life support treatment uh, that carries substantial risks that we know from decades of use. So I suppose you could say, well, it's something different than an endotracheal tube technologically it's uh, you know bigger <laughs> more involved and you have to learn how to apply it but we had to learn how to place endotracheal tubes too and they carry such risks so if we have something less invasive uh, you know I, I think we need to uh, continue to work with it to see what patient populations can benefit from it and some of the things that Levine and I wrote about in the editorial uh, and the authors commented on in the paper is that there could be subsets of patients for yeah. whom this is in fact ideal. Uh, we, we didn't talk too much about that, but PEEP is a, you know, the critical recruiting lung recruitment tool in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, whether you have an endotracheal tube or a, a mask interface of some sort. And so maybe the people that are PEEP responsive should get this. So Levine and I tried to make a point that, uh, it's good to have these tools in your armamentarium as long as number one, you know how to use them safely. Number two, you have a careful eye to figuring out who will benefit from them. And it's probably not everybody, you know, looking for the, you know, 5,000 or 1,000 patient trial that tells you, okay, put that technology away and accept this new technology in toto. That's, that, I think that's fanciful. But being wise about a set of tools in your kit as an intensivist, I think is wise. Levine, do you think um, do you think uh, over the coming years uh, you'll urge the purchase of more helmets in your ICU? So maybe just to go back to your your previous sure. statement about not necessarily seeing the five hundred or thousand person trial, I think one of the most amazing um, positive things about this pandemic that that I, I think we've all probably spoken about at, at some point. 
uh, has been the collaboration that we've been able to achieve and establish across the critical care community. And I feel like we're probably all closer um, as, as critical care researchers. So I actually think that it is plausible um, that we, we could have the 500 or 1,000 person trial of helmet uh, versus high flow nasal cannula. But as, as Jesse alluded to, I think in the process of designing that, we need to be smart about trying to tease out who are the subgroups that are going to re uh, respond to one intervention versus the other, because there's probably heterogeneity of treatment effect here. Um, so, so I do think it's possible. I think Helmet has just recently been approved by Health Canada. That's why we don't have big Helmet programs in Canada yet. Um, but we we, um, we have applied in our institution, um, does have some funding to further evaluate the potential role of Helmet compared to high flow nasal cannula. And in the design phase, we're trying to be smart about trying to really tease out those those differential subgroups that may may benefit or not. Um, so yes, I think we're going to see start to see more helmet in Canada, and I think we really need to focus on which is it the, the subgroup that would benefit from it. Uh, Dominica, I, I'd like um, I'd like to give you the last word. Uh, as I said, um, all the COVID nineteen papers have been uh, triaged to me. I, I mean, for research, it's I've I've looked at thousands of papers, and I just felt when I read this, it was a gem. I, I just really liked it. I, I mean. Big RCTs are nice, three, four, five thousand that you see in the cardiology world, occasionally in the intensive care unit world. But sometimes these smaller studies are nuggets. So I'd I'd like to give you the final the final word. So really, thanks for these words and um, thank you thank you very much. So I think that um, the future of research. I fully agree that the future of research on this topic is try to individualized subgroups of patients that may really benefit from one treatment or the other. Maybe there are some patients who only need flow, so the, the, the uh, increase of the uh, oxygen amount that, we, that, that they are receiving. And the, the, there are others that really need the amount of pressure maybe to control the inspiratory effort. One, one idea could be that patients with intense inspiratory effort, they need something to relieve it. So maybe they, they need helmet and IV. We, we, we saw that there are patients who, in whom the inspiratory effort is not high, they are completely calm, and uh, they do not experience these huge tidal volumes that Lavina was mentioning. Uh, maybe in these patients, the optimal tool is just to increase the amount of oxygen they are receiving, so the use of high flow. Um, uh, I think I fully agree that the future of the research on this topic is, yes, run, conduct randomized control studies, but just to identify the uh, patient's population in which the intervention may, may, may work better. This is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA, and it, in some regards, this conversation represents um, something Lavina said, which is international cooperation. Jesse Hall is from Chicago. Lavina uh, Munchi is from Toronto, and the author, Domenico Luca Greco, is from Italy. We've been discussing the paper, The Effect of Helmet Non-Invasive Ventilation Versus High-Flow Nasal Oxygen on Days Free of Respiratory Support in Patients with COVID-19 and moderate to severe hypox hypoxemic respiratory failure, the Hennevat randomized clinical trial. And um, it's been accompanied by an editorial respiratory support during the COVID-19 pandemic. Is it time to consider using a helmet? And I, I would be remiss not to say hello to the senior author, who is a very, very close friend, Massimo Antonelli, uh, who um, uh, I think chaired the, the study group. Um, to the three of you, I, I say thank you and, and stay healthy and thank you for your extraordinary clinical care you've given the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Congratulations. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.